Chapter 16 MDMA A few key facts. MDMA is a synthetic substance first created in 1912. It's somewhere between a stimulant and a psychedelic, sometimes called an empathogen. It rose in popularity along with dance music in the 1980s and 1990s. It's consumed by swallowing or snorting. Onset occurs after around half an hour, and intoxication can last a few hours. Some effects include connection with others, euphoria, well-being, mild perceptual alterations, jaw clenching, increased heart rate and body temperature. I was a bit too young to go to raves, and I was more of a Britpop kind of a girl myself anyway, but growing up in the 1990s, I remember news reports about ecstasy, the drug young people were taking in warehouses that led them to dance until all hours. I worked out what Ebenezer Good by The Shaman was about when I heard it on top of the pops at age nine, much to the initial shock and then amusement of my dad, who hadn't cottoned on himself, and I very vividly remember, a few years later, the death of a young woman called Leah Betts. This is a somewhat narrow experience of MDMA, personal to me, but it was, and remains, a culturally relevant drug, being integrally linked to clubs and raves of the 1990s, and also, according to many studies, more commonly used outside of these environments in social gatherings at people's homes, for example. Back when I first became aware of it, the talk was very much about pills or ecstasy, and I don't think I realised for a while that ecstasy and MDMA were the same thing. Throughout the rest of this chapter, I'll refer to MDMA. This is the chemical name for the compound, 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine. But E's, ecstasy, pills, mollies, garys, all these names most often refer to MDMA. It's one of those drugs that often comes in generic tablet or powder form, so one thing to bear in mind throughout this chapter is that I'm talking about what we know about the science of the particular compound MDMA. The actual contents of a powder or pill purchased on the street may not conform to these descriptions, as substances sold as MDMA might contain no active substance, a different active substance, or could be cut with a variety of things that might impact on the severity and duration of intoxication from it. What is it? MDMA is a synthetic stimulant in the amphetamine family. It was first synthesised and patented in Germany in 1912, originally as an intermediate product when developing a medication to control bleeding. Its psychoactive properties weren't initially realised, and although there were reports of street seizures in the USA as early as 1969, it wasn't until the mid-1970s that it began to be popularised, initially in counselling settings, particularly in California and the USA. Chemist Alexander Shulgin synthesised it and experimented on himself. He thought that the effects would be useful within the therapeutic setting, as a related substance called MDA had been used similarly in the 1960s, and so recommended it to a few therapist friends, as well as taking it recreationally himself. Its use as a recreational drug began at this time by Shulgin himself and his friends, who apparently referred to the drug as a low-calorie martini. But usage really rose when dance music became popular in Ibiza and then the UK in the mid to late 1980s. MDMA powder is white or off-white, usually with small crystals, although larger crystals are sometimes sold as well. In tablet form, it can be any number of different shapes, sizes and colours, but generally they will look like chalky tablets. Although often referred to as pills, really MDMA comes in tablets, which are usually flat and round. Often, batches of pills will have a pattern or logo stamped onto them, anything from an acid house yellow smiley face to a car logo. That said, while two pills that look the same may be from the same batch, it doesn't necessarily mean they will contain the same amount of MDMA or lead to the same experience. It's also very hard to estimate how much powder is an equivalent dose to a tablet, which can lead to people accidentally taking a far higher dose than they intend to. The criminal market around MDMA can make risks higher. Batches of tablets might be made to look the same as those with a reputation of being of a certain quality, but could be completely different. Obviously, there's no standardisation or quality control in the creation of batches of MDMA, so there could be differences within the same batch as well as between them. What are the short-term effects? The intoxication effects of MDMA usually begin after around half an hour to 90 minutes if swallowed, but onset can be quicker if snorted. 
Intoxication can then last anywhere between four to six hours, depending on the dose consumed. Of course, there's also a lot of individual variation. This will impact on the dose that can be tolerated, the time after taking it until the effects start to be felt, how long you'll remain intoxicated before the effects wear off, that sort of thing. Your body weight, biological sex, whether or not you've eaten recently, and plain random differences will all impact on this. Much like many other drugs, set and setting also play a part on what an intoxication experience will be like on that particular day, in that particular place, with those particular people. MDMA can be smoked, although this is an inefficient way of consuming it. It's also possible to inject it, though this method of consumption is rare. MDMA's intoxication effects make it extremely popular with clubbers, making them feel loved up and connected to each other, but also energised and motivated. Feelings of euphoria are reported by people who take MDMA, and some people experience mild visual or perceptual changes. MDMA can increase feelings of well-being and can enhance sensory perception. Maybe that's why it can make repetitive dance music sound anthemic. As an aside, there's actually some evidence about why MDMA might be popular with clubbers from pharmacology research. Studies have found that MDMA induces stereotypical repetitive movements in lab rats. Rat dancing? MDMA can make people feel talkative and social, and can make people feel really connected to other people. Keen to talk about important and meaningful topics. Well, they certainly seem so at the time. In the 1980s, this was so widely believed in the USA that car bumper stickers and t-shirts advised people not to get married for six weeks after taking MDMA. Timothy Leary referred to it as instant marriage syndrome. Physically, MDMA is a stimulant, so it will increase heart rate and blood pressure. It can also induce jaw clenching and teeth grinding, the gurning associated with clubbers who use it. You might also experience slight eye jiggling, known scientifically as nystagmus. MDMA can improve sensory perception and can make touch more pleasurable, but if you're planning to use it to improve sexual experience, this might be challenging, as it can also cause erectile dysfunction and an inability to ejaculate, for men anyway. An admittedly small qualitative study of heterosexual women found that the drug increased the intensity of orgasm. Surveys have also found that MDMA intoxication is associated with an increase in risk-taking behaviours related to sex as well including having unprotected sex, multiple partners, and having sexual encounters that were later regretted. If taken at high doses, MDMA can increase blood pressure to dangerous levels. If combined with physical exertion, like dancing for example, high levels of MDMA can lead to hyperthermia, the overheating of the body. This can be extremely dangerous and can result in muscle degeneration and kidney failure. High doses of MDMA can also put a great deal of pressure on the cardiovascular system and occasionally cause seizures. Many people take more than one dose in a single session in an attempt to prolong the intoxication experience. However, short-term tolerance effects mean that a second dose in the same session is likely to have a shorter and possibly less pleasurable effect than the initial amount, and it will still increase the risk of overdose, so it's a hazardous strategy. MDMA overdose can be fatal, although perhaps less commonly than media reports on MDMA deaths might suggest. UK Office for National Statistics figures from 2018 suggest that the number of deaths per year directly attributable to MDMA have ranged from 58 in 2005 down to only 8 in 2010, since when it has increased again. 56 people had MDMA listed on their death certificate in 2017. It's also worth noting that these figures are for people who had any mention of MDMA on their death certificates. Where only MDMA is mentioned, these numbers roughly halve. Although very low in comparison to deaths from other substances like tobacco or alcohol, over recent years in the UK and elsewhere, the number of deaths from MDMA has been going up. Although it's not known definitively why this is, some researchers believe that it could be due to factors including a lack of education about drug harms, an increase in the number of people using MDMA, and an increase in the potency of MDMA currently available to buy, or it being contaminated with more potent or dangerous substances. What are the longer-term effects? The longer-term effects of MDMA are far less well understood. 
While randomised controlled studies can be conducted to investigate the impact of intoxication while using a substance, it's not possible to assign people randomly to either use MDMA for many years or not, and so we're left to observe what people choose to do. This creates uncertainty, as the people who use MDMA might be different from those who don't in lots of ways other than their MDMA use. For example, we know that many people who use MDMA also use a number of other psychoactive substances. And that's before we consider the impact of the illicit nature of the substance, which will make accurately estimating how much of what substance a person has used over a number of years almost impossible. We do know a small amount from observational studies, though we need to be cautious as to how to interpret them. For example, heavy use of MDMA over prolonged periods has been linked to liver damage. There are also studies linking such patterns of use to risk of depression, anxiety, panic attacks and insomnia. It's not yet clear how clinically relevant these findings are, and it's also hard to tease out whether these are long-term risks or related to intoxication, as acute MDMA use can also induce these symptoms. Recent work has compiled all of the research investigating associations between MDMA and executive function, the processes controlled by the brain that help us to manage tasks and achieve goals. In particular, changes in ability to perform tasks such as information updating, shifting or switching tasks, and the withholding or inhibiting of responses have been linked to MDMA use. The researchers, some of whom are now my colleagues at the University of Liverpool, then used a technique called meta-analysis to combine these papers together to assess the relationship across all the different individual studies. This meta-analysis found that compared to people who use other substances but not MDMA, MDMA users performed more poorly on these tasks, although the overall effect was small. The results certainly don't suggest that there are millions of people who can't function properly on a day-to-day -day level because of MDMA use. It's not possible to be sure that MDMA is the cause of this difference, though, as, like all observational studies, the researchers could not randomly assign some people to use MDMA and some not, so there may be other differences between users and non-users. The use of an other substance using control group in this study is a strength, however, and just because this type of study design isn't able to work out whether an association is causal or not, that doesn't mean the link isn't causal, only that we can't tell from this study. Myths and misconceptions You need to drink tonnes of water if you take MDMA. Keeping hydrated while you're intoxicated is good advice, particularly if you're dancing or somewhere really warm but the idea that you need to drink far more water than you normally would while on MDMA came about due to the popularity of MDMA in clubs, where people were dancing for hours in hot rooms. Because MDMA can lead to hyperthermia, overheating, the need to consume water was highlighted. Clubs were encouraged to have chill-out areas and provide free water. But unfortunately, the message as to why and in what circumstances water should be consumed and how much was lost, and sometimes with tragic consequences. Leah Betts was at a house party when she took a tablet containing MDMA in November 1995. She wasn't dancing and she wasn't in a hot room. Nonetheless, reports state that she drank seven litres of water in approximately 90 minutes, which led to water intoxication and eventually severe swelling of the brain, which caused her to go into a coma from which she would not recover. For information, advice states that a person should sip approximately one litre of water in the course of an hour if they are dancing, and less if they are not. Another property of MDMA is that it can reduce the ability to urinate. This property can make the drinking of vast amounts of water even more dangerous. At the inquest into her death, toxicologist John Henry is reported as saying, if Leah had taken the drug alone, she might well have survived. If she had drunk the amount of water alone, she would have survived. It's extremely unlikely that Leah would have consumed so much water if she hadn't taken MDMA. The actions of people while intoxicated are important to consider, as well as toxicity from the substance itself. So this is partly true. MDMA causes brain lesions. It seems likely that this myth may have resulted from a since-retracted paper. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University in the USA injected five squirrel monkeys and five baboons with three moderate doses of what they believed to be MDMA and found impact on levels of the neurotransmitters dopamine and serotonin in the animals. 
Their findings were published in the journal Science, one of the most highly respected scientific journals in the world, and in their paper they concluded that their results should concern recreational MDMA users who might be unwittingly putting themselves at risk of neuropsychiatric disorders. At the time, this finding was extremely surprising, as MDMA had not been linked to an impact on dopamine before. But this study suggested not only dopaminergic neurotoxicity, but also found that the animals in the study displayed symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. But all was not as it seemed. Almost exactly a year after the paper was published, the authors retracted it. After they had tried and failed to replicate the study, they began to grow suspicious that something had gone awry in their original study. Although the MDMA batch that they used for the initial study had since run out, by examining the brains of the monkeys and baboons in the study, they worked out that in fact they had administered the primates methamphetamine and not MDMA at all. At the doses they had given, their findings were much more as expected from methamphetamine, and the authors duly retracted the paper but not before the initial findings received a great deal of media attention. Not only that, but the study didn't find brain lesions in the first place. Pictures used to illustrate the study in the media used brain images that appeared to have holes in them, but in fact the images showed differences in blood flow in different regions, not holes at all. So it's a myth. MDMA powder is safer than ecstasy tablets because it's not cut with other things. This isn't true. While tablets are often cut with anything from caffeine to amphetamine, it's perfectly possible for a powder to be mixed with these substances as well, and samples have been found that contain synthetic cathinones such as mephedrone or other substances such as PMA that have been found in both tablets and powder, some of which might be more harmful than MDMA at the same or even smaller doses. It's a myth. Does MDMA have any medical uses? Experiments are ongoing in trying to use low doses of MDMA during therapy sessions to help people with post-traumatic stress disorder talk about their trauma in an environment that doesn't trigger their panic. Because the intoxication effect of MDMA can make an individual feel safe, connected with those around them and motivated, it may aid the treatment of PTSD, which is notoriously hard, as often talking about the traumatic event can trigger a panic response. At present, results are thin on the ground and largely conducted by a small group of researchers, but promising. It will be really interesting to see whether other independent groups replicate these findings. Some researchers believe that chronic MDMA use leads to serotonin depletion over time. This has been seen in primate research, but is harder to assess in humans. A recent study meta-analysed the existing work where molecular imaging brain scans of humans have been carried out. They found seven studies that had assessed this, and the evidence suggested a reduction in the numbers of serotonin transporter, a protein that controls how the neurotransmitter passes information between neurons, in ecstasy users compared to drug-using controls. Again, though, as levels were not measured before and after the use of MDMA, it's not certain these differences weren't there before. Of course, this doesn't mean that MDMA is not harmful to serotonin levels in the brain. And it's also not known whether, if this is the case, this depletion is reversible or not. As with so many illicit drugs, carrying out this research is tricky, relies on self-report, and is not ethical or practical to investigate via randomised trials. So it's often done by observing what people choose to do, thus not being able to rule out other differences. Even if we don't know for sure, it's certainly good advice to avoid taking any substance too regularly, keep doses low, and allow plenty of sober time between intoxication events.